So why don't we start with our opening remarks from some of our speakers and, and let's begin with Julia Freyer to get us started. Julia, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Schlander, for that introduction. So I recognize that uh, this uh, conference um, uh, and this fireside chat in particular is focused on transmission and distribution activities, not as much the generation and wholesale markets um, that come with the electricity sector. Um, what I wanted to start with is the observation that we rarely think about transmission and distribution functional areas as being market oriented or transactional um, in nature. The more typical keywords that at least I've grown up with in this industry um, when I think about transmission and distribution is monopoly provider, and I heard that today from our recap of yesterday, regulated cost of service rate um, maker, and rate payers. We usually talk about rate payers uh, instead of customers. Um, but um, leaving aside the vocabulary that we've developed over the decades, I think we need to, um, I actually, I don't think we need to shy away from thinking about markets and market mechanisms if we frame it in the context of incentives and choice. In fact, for over three decades uh, here in the US, but also abroad in various jurisdictions, we have utilized performance-based rate making or incentive rate making um, uh, to regulate utilities uh, in the electricity sector, but also in other infrastructure industries. And the premise, the underlying premise of performance-based rate making is that um, we try to mimic uh, the driving factors that are present in truly competitive markets and industries. Mm -hmm. um, what is that driving factor? Well, it's profit. And it's the ability to win over consumers and potentially the ability, not a guarantee, but potentially the opportunity to draw um, out for shareholders the um, pursuit of above average profits. That of course scares many regulators and I recognize that because uh, we view profit as a, um, as an expense line item, a line item in regulated rates that needs to be uh, controlled in order to protect consumers. Um, but based on my own experiences, and I've worked on a, um, a few dozen performance-based rate making cases, um, either directly or as an advisor, um, and I've learned that good incentive regulation really throws off benefits for both shareholders and customers. Um, and importantly, customers care not only about what they pay for their rates, but they also are increasingly interested um, about the quality of their service, the gadgets that they get um, to improve their life uh, from their provider, and the general choices that they can make about how they pay, when they pay, and what they pay. I think the job of the utilities is try to figure out what they can offer their rate payers, their consumers, let's stop calling them consumers, in addition to just the plain vanilla delivery of a commodity, the electrons. And I hope that I can convince some of you today um, that regulators and policy ma makers need to support that initiative. I actually frankly think that the concept of a natural monopoly will eventually go away even for the wires business as customers gain some flexibility and freedom from the grid. What do I mean by freedom? I mean the ability to store energy for later use in their house, in their vehicles, in their handheld devices. I also mean the ability for consumers to produce their own energy through distributed energy resources and ability to decide when to use the grid and from where. This may sound a bit crazy today um, and uh, probably a very scary for the um, traditional utility manager and, and perhaps um, uh, a little bit uh, um, <laughs> uncertain for a typical regulator, but I think it creates a number of opportunities as well for customers. Um, and as part of my reading of the crystal ball, I don't see the possibility of customers truly bypassing all utility and grid services. Um, but I do see more movement of customers and I see an, a, bu a business model that needs to evolve and present a service, not just a commodity uh, to win over customers. So 
I appreciate the audience um, today has a lot of regulators and policymakers. So you're probably wondering how you can help move the needle in that direction. And uh, I yes. I think you can help by removing some of the legacy restrictions around how we view the conventional utility. Um, maybe removing some of the safety nets that have essentially created, I think, a bit of a roadblock to consumer choice and mobility. Uh, maybe instead of franchise area socialized rates for transmission and distribution systems, what we need are more dynamic locational rates for service that reflect the actual needs and valuations of the system at a given point in time at a given location. Now, I'm not intending for this to get very complex and unwieldy. Simplicity is still the goal of any good regulatory policy. But I think there's a natural trade-off uh, that we need to think about in designing of rates and uh, compensation mechanisms. I also think customers need incentives. Um, the regulated environment has made customers way too passive, way too reliant on the status quo, perhaps even reliant on the omnipotence of regulators in protecting them. Um, we don't want to make the lives of customers more challenging, but I think there is so much great technology out there um, that is smart, that is programmable, so it could go on automated autopilot um, and facilitate decision making. Um, and I think um, it's important for us to start to think about how to use that technology um, with the customers. Um, I also feel that regulation um, personally has made me passive. I've simply not been motivated, but there are other decisions in my own life where I am very active, still risk averse, but very active in making decisions on um, purchases of various services, entertainment, um, transportation, um, uh, uh, purchases of uh, um, other commodities like heating oil for my house. And I do it in a more um, active and um, personalized way than I do with electricity. So why can't electricity service also be that way? So I think as customers, we may get a bit complacent, so we need incentives to do that. So um, perhaps if you bear with me for another minute or so, I know two themes today we had was compensation and market mechanisms. So I wanted to give you a few words on my thoughts on those two topics. When I think of compensation, I historically thought of a single direction of flow of funds in the utility sector. The utility is paid by the consumer. Um, and that's how we've known it for 40 years. Um, I recently went up uh, online to look up when the word prosumer was first coined. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with it. It's not a pretty word. I'm not sure I wanna use it uh, these days, but I realized just uh, last week that this terminology was actually coined 40 years ago. <laughs> so the concept of prosumer is not new. I think our, um, our uh, dealing with this challenge and opportunity in this sector is new. Um, and I think this changes the flow of funds because we have customers that are producing electricity with their own behind the meter devices. And we need to have compensation schemes that are fair to those customers and fair to other customers um, um, that don't have those devices. Um, and more importantly, I know fairness is an important thing in policy. We also want efficiency. We don't want cross subsidization or um, um, uh, substandard suboptimal results in terms of um, who's producing electricity, uh, too much elect electricity that goes to waste. We, we want to make sure the resources are um, allocated to those that value them. So I'd like to share a few statistics on compensation um, and what we're seeing um, as kind of the evolving trend. Uh, from the 1970s to the 2000s, we had a major build out of oil fire generation. Um, and gas-fired combustion turbines and CCGTs, I think on average between 1970 and 2019, so the last 50 or so years, we were adding 14,000 megawatts of capacity every year. Uh, now we're seeing a trend. It's no longer as much gas. We, we're seeing a surge in wind and solar resources as well as other renewables. We're now at 18,000 megawatts of renewables being added annually. And that's a statistic that covers the last 10 years. And it's ramping up. Um, I think in the last five years, it's now at about 20,000 megawatts per year on average. 
and we're expecting 37,000 megawatts of wind and solar by the end of this year, according to the US Energy Information Administration. How much of that is distributed energy resources? Well, not an insignificant amount. Um, approximately five gigawatts, a little over five gigawatts, or about 14% of that this year is going to be small scale solar PV. And that has raised the issue of how we set rates for those that produce. How do we retain the benefits of a simpler scheme like net metering while improving the efficiency, the locational, the time-based, attribute-based um, aspects of how we value distributed energy resources? I think consumers will be better off if they're given more choices for how we compensate them for electricity at their point of delivery and when they demand it or when they can produce it. We need to make sure that the pricing is not too complex, the compensation scheme, but also not too simple as to create suboptimal outcomes. Uh, we don't want to overbuild our system to the point where it isn't actually creating significant value. Um, we don't want to also underbuild and create uh, scarcity uh, that we all have to pay for in the short term. I think the answer lies in adapting incentive compatible and opportunity cost based models, which we have lots of experience with over the decades as we've developed wholesale competitive markets. Um, and I think um, this leads me maybe to my last big point uh, for my opening remarks, where I think the distinction that we've had historically between retail and wholesale has become a very gray area. And I don't expect it to um, get back its black and white line in the sand characteristics anytime soon. I think um, what is going to happen is that we will get market mechanisms, the second topic of our fireside cha chat, that are essentially producing products and services that cross over. Is that bad? Um, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm going to leave all the legal um, oriented policy arguments about the lack of a black and white standard to um, experts in that field to discuss and debate. But as an economist, I think having goods and services that customers demand, regardless of the fact that we can't place them into the wholesale bucket or the retail bucket, I think that's a good thing. And um, it will also evolve the markets we have. And I think customer involvement in our wholesale markets is a very good thing because it's going to let us let go of many of the concerns we have with market power, monopolies, and lack of competition that um, short-term wholesale electricity markets currently face. We need to allow the utilities that we currently have to compete, and we need to allow customers the ability to choose. And part of that is education. Um, both the utilities and the customers need information to make rational decisions. And I, in my humble opinion, one of the most important things that regulators and policymakers can do to support market mechanisms and competition um, is to make sure that there is adequate information about choices out there for the small customer, for the large customer, for the um, small utility, for the startup utility. And it naturally follows that I would like to see regulators lower their guard a little bit and allow customers to make more choices and for utilities to cater to those choices. So that's it for my opening remarks. I welcome the opportunity to chat further on these topics with the rest of the panel. Hey, thank you very much, Julia. And uh, I'm trying to wrap my head around being an uh, omnipotent uh, regulator. I'm gonna have to try to understand that phrase a little bit more as we move forward. Thanks again for your opening comments. <laughs> I guess we're ready to throw a, another log on the fire and uh, let's move on to Mark Patterson, good morning, and how are things in Australia? Yeah, well, good morning, Paul, and uh, to everyone else. And, and speaking about omnipotence or omnipresence, I'm speaking to you from the future. Uh, so uh, I'm speaking to you from, what is it, Wednesday. So it's looking good. Uh, I, can, I can tell you at least that much. Um, so thanks so much for uh, the opportunity to be with you all. Um, so, uh, so basically, I just wanted to give you a, a brief snapshot on um, uh, what Audrey Zibelman has called um, a postcard from the future, uh, being what's going on in Australia, particularly with regard to 
um, the uh, hyper decentralization of electric systems uh, here um, in Australia. And obviously, just to sort of calibrate your thinking, Australia um, is a similar landmass to continental US uh, with just less than 10% of the population. So, um, so we've got some huge challenges in terms of the transport of electrons um, across the continent to you know, a relatively sparsely populated landmass. Um, to give you a sense of what's happening here, um, so Australia is uh, right now tracking in the direction of um, uh, 40 to 50 percent of our annual generation volume, so we're talking gigawatt hours, uh, being delivered by, from distributed sources. Uh, so that's not instantaneous, that's uh, annual volumetric. Um, uh, so you can imagine that that is, uh, that is transformational to the nature and, and indeed the architecture um, of the system, both in terms of the physics-based architecture, but also the economics uh, and regulatory architecture uh, that sits around that. Indeed, uh, large sections today, as in 2020, um, of the system are already uh, experiencing over 50% penetration of rooftop solar um, on um, those particular sections of the uh, system, both in terms of residential, commercial and industrial um, customers. Um, and those large sections of uh, the system um, are already experiencing points of time um, during the year where 100% um, of instantaneous demand is being served from the bottom end of the system. In other words, from the um, uh, DERs uh, themselves. So um, that's a, so. In that case, we're talking about instantaneous demand, 100% or thereabouts being served from the polar opposite end of the system from what it was originally designed. Uh, so again, you know, one of my points of emphasis when I talk about this is what we're talking about in that case is not incremental. That is transformational. Um, in its character uh, in terms of how the system is evolving. Um, <clears throat> just to give you a sense of what's going on in this country to deal with that, um, so Stratagen has the privilege of working with a federal government initiative uh, very elegantly known as the Post-2025 Market Design Project, uh, which is all about uh, dealing with at a national level with our national electricity market uh, the transformational realities that we need to be thinking about across a whole range of dimensions, including uh, resource adequacy, uh, central system services, um, the development of a two-sided market at the wholesale level, uh, the deep DR integration um, into that uh, system as well, so a whole range of elements. Uh, let me just go from that kind of broad overview just to five reflections that I'll, I'll give you just as we um, put a couple of logs on, on the, the fire um, and I hand to, to Tanya. Um, so the first uh, observation is um, certainly in the Australian context and over the last 10 years this has gone from being a very academic, interesting, almost quirky topic that will never happen uh, to being a uh, vastly no longer an academic topic. It's a real world uh, challenge, if you like, for the system that uh, we're now um, not uh, thinking about or anticipating, but in the thick of um, a large scale uh, transformative process that's unfolding and that by, by necessity or, or by reality, such transformations um, have dimensions of disorderliness of non-linearity. Um, it's a scary world for all of us who've worked in the very orderly, structured, incremental um, uh, processes of the past. Um, and it is a world, as I say, that's no longer academic, that the topic of DSOs, DMOs, DR aggregations or DERPs, as our American friends like to call them, um, uh, are no longer academic. Um, they're kind of real world matters that we're ne needing to, um, that we're architecting right now and in which customer choices and behaviors are actually critical to the system operation and reliability. So that's point one, no longer academic. Point two, um, that 
regardless of the fact that this, uh, you know, in the past, the distribution uh, end of the system has been a, a relatively passive and low tech, uh, in some respects, um, end of the system with limited visibility, the complex interaction between physics and economics at the distribution level is becoming all the more critical uh, in this space. So um, the pesky laws of physics and for that matter, the pesky laws of economics and add in what I would call the pesky laws of humans, um, you know, that you've got this kind of dynamic interplay uh, between um, these elements, um, particularly in a world as per the first point where customer choices and behaviors are no longer just a kind of peripheral matter, they become uh, critical to um, the operation of the system, both in terms of their investment choices, what equipment, what uh, uh, gadgets, technologies are they investing in, and also how are they using those. Um, so um, not academic, um, that complex interaction between physics and economics. Thirdly, um, incentivizing the positive DER services um, from uh, from those distributed resources becomes increasingly critical to both system efficiency and social equity outcomes. So you know, as you have an increasing proportion of your system that is now becoming decentralized, in other words, as my friends and colleagues, Lorenzo Cristobal, Paul Di Martini would emphasize, you know, you're moving from this uh, highly centralized world to an increasingly uh, decentralized um, and layered uh, structure um, and because of those services are no longer becoming just they're no longer just um, uh, an interesting uh, academic exercise they're becoming central to the efficiency and operation of the system um, the incentive structures the market structures need to be um, elegant and um, and capable of incenting from millions of privately owned resources, the right services at the right time, at the right location. And those are ultimately physics-based services of real power, reactive power, and, and reserves. So, you know, real services, real positive outcomes being incentivized from large fleets of privately owned assets at the right time and at the right location. Fourthly, um, this is a really critical point that I know um, President uh, Schellander uh, and we as uh, um, panelists were discussing in our preparations was, yes, but how is it that humans actually get interested in this stuff? You know, and, you know, do we kid ourselves that everyone's going to get very excited about, you know, managing someone else's electric system? Well, the reality is that nobody, um, ever connected to electricity uh, to make their lives more complex. Um, the only reason we electrified as a society was the value proposition underlying electric systems is make my life easier, make my business more efficient, let me get on with the things that matter most to me. So any clever scheme that we come up with as industry professionals that makes people's lives more complex is a fail from the get-go. Um, so here's the point. The point is that with all the things we've just been talking about, human-centered design of incentives and how they meet technologies must deliver simple, effortless, but high impact out outcomes for customers. You have to be applying human-centered design that we have in our iPhones and you know so many of the devices that our other industries have excelled in. You have to be applying behavioral economics and choice architecture. And here's the scary thought, behavioral economics empirically will tell you the more information you give a human empirically, the more uh, uh, suboptimal their decision making becomes. And we need to let that sink in because there's a re there is actually a inverse uh, relationship between the volume of information we provide and the quality of decision that any of us are actually capable of making. Scary thought, uh, it's an empirical fact. Kahneman and others will, will demonstrate that. Last point, um, uh, point five. Um, the transition of compensation and market mechanisms has to be viewed from the future. Um, and when it's viewed that way, you will see that this is transformational, not incremental. 
But to make that manageable, you need to take that, if you like, uh, future back view and then build it out from a present forward view. So we need, we need to actually, in our sector, we tend to largely focus in a steady state world for the last 50 or 100 years. We've depended heavily on a change, uh, a theory of change, which is based on what I would call a present forward model. We stand in the present, we incrementally tweak our way forward. And that works okay in a steady state period. Where you've got large scale transformative change, Sure, you need to continue to do that, but you need, now need to overlay that with what I'd call a present back uh, theory of change to say, how do we begin to understand collectively what our plausible future states need to be on this topic, for example, of incentives and market mechanisms? How do we architect what the broad uh, outlines of those need to be in 10 or 15 years? And then how do we use that insight to reverse engineer that journey from the present back to the, uh, sorry, from the future back to the present. That is the only way to begin to architect um, what is a complement, complex transition and make that politically survivable, but break it down into <coughs> achievable chunks without being um, unduly constrained by all of the historic um, present constraints that we find ourselves in. And we've seen that uh, work extremely effectively um, in navigating a lot of those complexities uh, in this country. I'm going to stop at that point um, uh, and perhaps uh, I think hand to my colleague Tanya uh, Barham. Yes, and, and Tanya, uh, why don't we go ahead and take it there. Thank you, Mark, for a few doses of pragmatism. And we'll move now to Tanya Barham from the Community Energy Labs. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, everybody, for being here. So my name is Tanya Barham. I'm with Community Energy Labs, and I'm also a member of the Gridwise Architecture Council. So uh, you know that all of this is going to end with a shameless plug for transactive energy, and I'd like to encourage everyone to make use of our policymakers checklist through Gridwise Architecture Council online, as well as the upcoming Transactive Energy 101, which talks about transactive energy as a tool to do just what Mark was talking about. You know, how do we balance those pesky laws of physics, enable more choice, et cetera. So um, I know we aren't supposed to necessarily do screen sharing, but I'm hoping, Carrie, because I'm kind of a visual learner and I know other people are, that I might be able to use some slides to illustrate some of my early points. I'm very excited to talk to you today about how some of the largest drivers of change in the electrical system, that is customer choice and growing demand for rapid decarbonization, are what are presenting this really exciting opportunity for innovating our system and markets through partnering with local communities and customers to bring back this old mantra of think globally and act locally. I am not necessarily, in fact, I'm not at all, I would not purport to be a market expert. So that is not why I think I was asked to be on this panel. My understanding is that part of the reason I'm on this panel is to speak a little bit with the voice of the customer um, as somebody who has uh, for a number of years been working on technology commercialization from research and development to broad commercial scale within the energy sector, both grid connected solar photovoltaics, the early days of independent power producers, um, building technologies like HVAC optimization coupled with energy incentives through utilities, and then more recently for the past four years, working on grid-connected distributed energy resources, microgrids, virtual power plants, and other aggregations of resources, assets, and products that communities can adopt in order to more rapidly achieve their goals of increased resilience, decarbonization, whether or not their utilities on board. And those efforts, and so I was previously the Director of Product and Operations or COO of PECI. We were working nationally with organizations to try and help them achieve their goals. But the truth of the matter here is that there are more than 100 million Americans living in a community committed to 100% clean and renewable energy and decarbonizing everything. I know people think that can be a bit of a California um, initiative. It's not necessarily nationwide, but if you look at just the Pacific North America region, Oregon, Washington, 
California, British Columbia. It represents the world's fifth largest economy, and in particular has led the charge in coordinating a policy shift toward decarbonization. Many of these communities want to rapidly electrify buildings and transportation, increase the number of renewable energy and storage assets that are connected to the distribution grid, and they want to displace bulk coal and gas generators on the grid with carbon-free energy sources. So you heard Mark say, and actually both of our early presenters say, this is transformational. We are actually moving from generation following loads, simple meant that you could turn on a switch and the power was there, to one where loads have to follow generation. We need more flexibility at every level of our energy system, customer devices, distribution system assets, um, distribution automation through better switching, advanced distribution management system, our T&D interface, and our bulk resources coordinating with one another to create power systems that work more effectively in this changing landscape. But matching that renewable generation with the increasingly unpredictable energy use has turned out to be complicated to solve at the system level. So this blue curve is energy demand in a building. The icons are systems that drive energy use. We know this, in the morning the AC comes on, water's heating, cars are charging. In the afternoon, the AC's working extra hard because people are opening doors and letting out cold air. And that shape of energy demand is important because what climate laws are trying to accomplish is to increasingly get energy use to line up with local and grid scale power output. Again, that need for flexibility. This green line represents when renewables, in this case solar, are making power. As we all know, any energy use that's falling outside of this curve can be met by, uh, is probably going to be met by fossil fuels where anything underneath it is solar in this case. So higher penetrations of DERs are, you know, increasingly trying to tackle the randomness of this curve. And on the supply side, many energy providers are struggling to incorporate this large and increasing influx of renewable generation. In mid-2019, the California independent system operator curtailed enough renewable energy to power more than 30 million homes for an hour. And since then, the CAISO has blown that statistic out of the water. At the same time, resource adequacy studies show looming gaps in our region's <laughs> generating <laughs> reserves. Smiling under here. <laughs> we have lots of power and very little demand, and other times where we have little demand and too much power. And this relationship between energy supply and demand has become increasingly complex for grid operators as the underlying mix of customer behaviors, technologies, and expectations have changed. But the problem is that our mindset, as one of my early colleagues mentioned, has not changed about customers. If you look at markets and the role that customers play in their participation of markets, customers make choices through buying power and the ability to choose. In the very limited cases where we've given customers buying power, the ability to choose, and a meaningful difference from the alternative. So I'm going to use California CCAs, for example. California-enabled CCAs, which different than other CCAs, were allowed to procure their own generation, which has contributed to some of the physics problems on the grid. But when we look at the customer choice, they were giving a meaningful difference from their utility. Cheaper and quicker uh, uh, acquisition of 100% renewable bulk power resources. The CEC or the CPC estimates that more than 80% of customers in the state of California will be served by a non-utility entity by 2025. So when customers are given true choice, they don't choose utilities. Yet in the meantime, we believe incentive-based remuneration of customers is the same thing as choice. It is not, it is not. I call it the Mac versus PC problem. Incentives assume that all customers are completely rational actors and behaviors, and that every single consumer will be happy with a time of use price, for example, which allows no flexibility on the choice side. They have no real choice. They have to take this incentive. The incentive offers no way for them to respond flexibly given their preferences. So the things that we need to do to enable better choice, and, and we see how this works. Demand response programs, for example, when we don't allow customers to meaningfully participate in the market, and incentives don't do that. Uh, what happens? Demand response is a great example. From the utility side, it's considered not reliable and too expensive. It's not as flexible as a gas um, uh, a generator, for example, and it's cost at bulk, given how much incentive we have to give in order to get a response from the consumer, is not cost effective at scale. Is that a problem? Does that mean that customer um, programs don't work? Well, that's certainly the perspective of the utility. 
but it's definitely not the truth. Part of the issue is that why are the products that utilities offer and offer incentives for so bad that customers don't want to choose them? Let's look at who's good at making products. If you think about your favorite product companies, what do they do that other uh, what do the other competitors do not do? I'd like to say, and this doesn't mean, to Mark Patterson's point, that products aren't complex. The technical product can be complex, but the way that we market them isn't complex. It's tailored to the buyer. So if anyone here remembers the Mac versus PC commercials, anybody remember those? Give me a reaction in your chat, right? A personal computer is an incredibly technical product. Mac versus PC really plays upon what we're seeing with utility-based incentives, which is the PC is trying to explain the technical underpinnings of its product and why it's so hard for them and customers take this incentive and buy my PC. Whereas the Mac is describing, hey, here's a great benefit that this can provide you. And, he, and that benefit might not be an incentive because at the level that you would need to incent a customer with a financial incentive at scale, would never work. It's too expensive. It looks more expensive and less flexible than a gas um, generator. But that is, of course, because you might not be speaking. Money might not be the thing that incentivizes that user. And not understanding your customer means that utilities do not understand how to incentivize consumers. So there are a couple things that I think um, can help us. You know, there are a couple reasons that utilities are so bad at making products. Number one, they don't know how to use data. They're remunerated based on capital expenditure. So of course, performance might be one thing, but also understanding data and understanding customers is not a skill set. IT, software, product creation is not a skill set of utilities. Um, additionally, they are right, rightfully frightened by competition rather than embracing competition. These are folks who have been protected by monopolies. When they create a demand response program and it fails, they are compensated regardless, plus a small return. So there's very, little, uh, there's very little incentive for them to create a truly transformational and very good product because they, their customers will pay for it whether or not their customers want it. So unless we expose them to competition, they're not going to be incentivized to improve. And without exp you know, that exposition, creating, for example, an Airbnb marketplace for services, they can offer their Airbnb, they can create, utilities can compete, sounds great, compete against the free market in a platform of services for consumers. Go ahead, you can go on Airbnb, you can offer your room for $1,000 a night for a broom closet. That's fine, absolutely, put it out there. But see whether or not there's any uptake when you offer it for somebody else who obviously has a better understanding of what customers want in the first place. So, and furthermore, there are mechanisms in place other than the, the way that utilities are remunerated for their customer facing products, which preference the utilities, they're also allowed to be the kingmakers and to pick well, who their competitors are by partnering with startups. And I think this presents a couple problems. Number one, if you've ever seen intellectual property agreements in um, contracts with utilities to provide these services, they preclude, um, they allow utilities to continue owning anything in the heads of the entrepreneurs um, to serve customers, their employees from now until perpetuity, which makes that intellectual property much less valuable and therefore makes it much less likely that that company will be able to secure investment from outside investors in order to scale nationwide. So they preclude competition through their grabbiness around intellectual property. Additionally, there's very low diversity and low diversity contributes to problematic product design. Only 22% of the utility workforce nationwide is women, as opposed to 47% of the broader labor force nationwide. Only 5% of power sector board executives are women. And I think this leads to a very funny TikTok video that's going around, my kid and probably your kids have forwarded to, about when Sally Ride was the first woman in space, she went to space for six days, and NASA gave her 100 tampons tied together like sausages, which if you are a woman, you probably just spit out all of your coffee thinking about how funny that is. But it was really a function of, it's not a lack of intelligence from the people who are implementing these programs, it's a lack of perspective and understanding what customers want or who you're serving. So a lack of diversity 
A lack of enabling mechanisms, incentives, again, are not real choice. A lack of real choice for customers, a lack of real competition leads to a lack of diversity, all lead to a very poor disposition toward product design, execution, implementation, cost effectiveness, and reliability. One way to solve that need for broad choice, increased competition, increased participation of customers, increase of real choice, is through what we call transactive energy, which is an elegant solution to, as Mark called it, pesky laws of physics, economics, and human interaction. I will leave it there for now. That was some colorful imagery, and I, and I certainly <laughs> appreciate that today. Um, why don't we just jump right in to, to some questions I have. A lot of you, you all sort of found yourselves as talking about consumers and consumer choice. So I think I wanna, wanna focus in on that a little bit. So what I'd like to do is just sort of maybe take a lesson that maybe I've seen as a regulator from the telecom sector and, and try to apply it to this DER movement and, and deregulation that, that needs to occur in order for a lot of this to, to evolve. You know, in, in the old days, my utility bill for telephone service was very predictable and somewhat reasonable. And, and now with the extremely deregulated and competitive environment with customer choice and all those whiz bang features, my voice, video, and data bill is the most expensive service of what used to be considered my utility bills. So how much am I going to have to pay to be one of the cool kids in this new environment that you want to see as it relates to an emerging energy sector? And, and what happens to the consumers that can't be the cool kids? What's going to emerge as the equivalent to the digital divide in the electricity sector? And I'd say anybody can jump on that. Yeah, thanks, uh, Paul. It's, a, I think, a great question. I think at the heart of um, the transition to um, a world where you have, well, we've always known for a long time that um, customers are not homogeneous. Uh, so there's a huge diversity in customer types. And I think to use Clayton Christensen's way of framing these things, what particular problems different types of customers are trying to solve in their engagement with the um, electric system. Um, and um, so to your point, um, it's very easy to, you know, um, incorrectly kind of frame in our minds that the future electricity customer is almost akin to a retired engineer who just wants to sit in their lounge room and pull levers and tweak things and sort of interact with this highly dynamic system. Whereas many other folks uh, may not, uh, you know, may never own their own roof, let alone their own solar PV, um, may not be able to engage directly in this exciting world. Uh, and so what are the various layers at which uh, we provide? Um, you know, there is, there is that, if you like, socialized service to some extent um, of some of the, the basic elements that uh, we require um, for life um, and well-being in a developed society. And at the same time, there's other layers of an electric system that increasingly become discretionary and become, you know, to use your words, Paul, the, where the cool kids may play. Um, and I think one of the dangers we've had in the past is that when we electrified back in the 20s, 30s, 40s, um, electricity you know, was largely used for things that were not really discretionary. They were about refrigeration, they were about a few <laughs> light bulbs and maybe some heating or something of that nature. Today, what we're talking about is a much wider range of things, uh, some of which fall into the, if you like, essentials for life and well-being. Others fall into the um, enable me to um, market my services, enable me to kind of uh, actually reduce my bill by providing services, but perhaps that may impose some imposts on the system to enable that additional functionality. So how does that, if you like, different layers of um, incentivization for different types of engagement with the electric system um, I know that's, that's only uh, what already was a complex question that you asked there, uh, Paul, uh, you know, only makes it a little more complex, but I think um, starting to think about it in a less homogeneous, one size fits all approach, and yet in a manner that is able to navigate some of the social equity 
matters that are embedded in that is certainly uh, a part of the equation. But I'll, I'll hand to my colleagues to see. You know, I'm sure they've got comments they wanted to, to make. I would like to jump in on Mark's coattails. Um, I heard you say earlier, Mark, that um, we have to manage customer choice and the behavior that comes with it. Um, and uh, maybe also combine it a little bit with what Tanya said uh, a few minutes ago, that customers vary. I think uh, perhaps my view on this is that um, we really need to understand the various customers. And we've never done that um, because we have treated customers as a class. We've got industrial customers, we've got residential customers, we've got commercial, but we haven't tried to actually go um, deeper to really understand the individual customers and how they use electricity, why they use electricity, and what value you get, they get. Um, uh, I, I assume, Paul, it's not just because it's cool to have a big um, entertainment, internet, phone bill, it's because you actually perceive personally value in paying for those services at the rate that you pay. Um, and you can afford it. So there's both the affordability piece, but also the benefit piece that drives you to commit to making those payments. Um, and I think um, generalizations aside, uh, I think it's very important for policymakers to um, understand customers at a more detailed level than we currently do in order to then um, consider, to be able to think outside the box and consider how we design rates, how we um, uh, design regulation probably, uh, and even plan our system to accommodate all those differences. And I think there's a methodic way to do that too. I think the first piece really for, for policymakers and um, regulators is to first learn about their customer and then to understand what drives those decisions um, and, and provide opportunities. Um, um, I think there was a fear many years ago as we were deregulating the telecom sector um, that we would have um, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of um, inequity um, in the outcomes. What I think few people predicted was the fact that um, providers of services, and some of them were very much uh, new, new entrants into the telecom sector, would come up with ways to overcome that. They would come up with plans and devices that were catering to a particular segment of the um, population and customer class to give them what they wanted. Um, as a silly example, and I think this generalizes things too much, but as an example, it still holds prepaid service plans, um, devices that uh, allow them to do something they never thought they could do in the first place with respect to connecting with the rest of the world through um, mobile um, devices. Um, um, and it, it touched upon so many segments of um, um, of their daily lives uh, for participants in terms of um, uh, not just employment, but education, health, well-being. So I think it's for us to be able to really think outside the box and know those individual customers. Okay, uh, Tanya, briefly, because I want to get to one more question on a, on a policy uh, piece. So if you could give me a quick uh, response. Yeah, absolutely. I loved that last um, response from Julia. I thought that was a great example. When we think about telecom, though, it is also a work in progress. So there are these three layers of our system. We've done a pretty good job of innovating at the bulk level for generation procurement through independent power planning, advancing, you know, planning and modeling through IRPs, looking at system level um, planning. A lot of great stuff has happened there. Now in transmission distribution, looking at distribution system planning and how we engage communities to co-create opportunities for non-wires alternatives and procurement of DERs and integration, they're still ongoing. But I think that next frontier is that services products and how do we enable competition that can scale. So you're not just a tower of Babel. There are companies that can offer services and scale. And in doing that in telecom, offering that platform where service providers could operate on the networks um, but repackaged to distinct groups of customers and value propositions. There was a period, I don't know if anyone remembers, when I got my first cell phone, you'd occasionally get that $500 a month. So I don't know that those fears are completely unfounded around equity, 
you know, usually though those providers would, there would be forgiveness, but eventually now they look at your data, they look at your usage patterns, and immediately they offer you packages that can comfortably accommodate what that machine learning anticipates will be your use. We have the capability if we could access more granular 15-minute um, interval data from customers, for example, from utilities all across the country. So enabling data, accurate 15-minute interval data is also part of that platform in addition to learning the customers better and providing that level playing field for product and service offerings to serve uh, customers and provide real choice and real customization that's driven by customer values. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Tanya. And uh, so clearly what, are, what we're hearing is you can't just set it and forget it. There's going to take a constant vigilance as we move forward. This next question, you know, and I wish I had a cord of wood for this fire because you, you, you're interesting uh, panel members to be involved with. I hope I get to actually have a fireside chat with you um, going forward. But let me get to this next question. And that is, you know, as, as we start to look at what it takes for these uh, types of uh, policies to actually emerge, it's going to be a huge change and shift. I think we only have about 17 states, as we heard yesterday, that have moved to totally restructured markets. So as we look at that, um, and you need to look at how they're going to promote those consumer choice options, it's going to include a lot of individual customer investment. Now, these very policies in states are supported and lobbied by the very businesses and industries that will profit from those policy changes. The same scenario that existed within the vertically integrated scenario for decades and still exists in a lot of states. So how do we avoid creating the same greed-driven scenario where we simply replace one greedy player with another? I mean, how do we avoid the shift from the, the den of thieves to the, the pack of wolves? I think that's a great question. Um, there, you know, public transparency is obviously a really important um, uh, aspect of any market. So, you know, I think there has to be um, means for not necessarily command and control, but some sort of public transparency, legal recourse for um, bad actors uh, and penalties that are sufficiently um, onerous as to prohibit uh, gaming the system. And sometimes you learn that through uh, mistakes, unfortunately. And obviously as elected officials or appointed officials, we wanna uh, avoid those. However, um, it, it does seem to me that we're able to operate most of the rest of, though greed is certainly a portion, obviously if you're not actually serving customer interests sustainably that's not going to be a viable business model in the long run and if you are breaking the law even you know the ubers and the lifts and the airbnbs of the world soon found that if you run afoul of local authorities it's not going to be good for your business model you are going to have to adjust so uh, creating a system where there's some accountability and transparency. And I think that's why blockchain has been so often equated with transactive energy, though the two are separate tools, because it creates a ledger where at that le level of um, granularity, it may be possible to have transparency, who's profiting, who's benefiting. And so opening it up and making sure that there's transparency and reporting and accountability with laws that have sufficient enough penalties to punish bad actors seems to me to be the right approach to regulating Taylor, those Mark? I would jump in and yeah, say that. Oh, go ahead, Mark. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, yeah, look, I was just going to uh, build on a couple of things Tanya mentioned, which I think were some great points. Um, just to first one, um, I think we're having a similar discussion here in Australia, and I, and I think Again, uh, giving people transparency is critical and enabling that with the tools that simplify some of the deep complexity that is where some of the um, malfeasance can occur. Let me give you one example and that is simply that, um, for example, as we move to a world where DERs are being incentivized for, to provide services to the system, um, the value of those services is beyond most mere mortals of properly evaluating. So actually uh, having share, a shared and agreed uh, societal means for valuing those services such that um, all parties can be held to account um, that you know, a fair uh, transaction value is being exchanged for the provision of those services I think is, is one uh, area where there's a real need to, to get greater visibility. 
one other thing I'd say here too is giving, uh, democratizing the ability for diverse stakeholders to participate in the um, evaluation of options, for example, using um, or making accessible uh, techniques such as the grid architecture work that has been undertaken by the uh, Department of Energy there and Pacific Northwest National Labs. There's a lot of tools there that can actually help um, much deeper um, engagement of stakeholders in the design of your future systems in a manner that is not just being asked to nod their heads or tip their hats at somebody else's complex proposals, uh, which they haven't really been able to properly engage on. And, and um, if I can add, and I'll try to make it short and sweet, um, I think um, in the US especially, we have a, um, a pretty, uh, pretty uh, adaptable and yet very much um, um, functioning, um, in contrast to maybe other parts of the world, legal framework to, um, um, to determine and to adjudicate what's right, what's wrong. Um, but when we embark on something that is transformational or major changing, I think in order to make sure that we can use that legal framework and the regulatory framework correctly and to its full ability, we need to do two things. One is I think we need to identify objectives up front. So before we, um, uh, I guess, uh, um, open it up, I think we need to have a, um, a frame, framing of the objectives we're trying to accomplish and then help hold everybody accountable, um, as uh, um, Tanya and Mark said, a transparency um, uh, around the process um, to some, um, some way, some harmonization or universality to some key aspects um, of what you're trying to achieve is important. I think the only other ingredient I would throw in there, sometimes, um, and I'm going to use your analogy, um, to help ensure that the wolves uh, don't get out of control, you might need to throw in a, a tiger into the mix. So um, uh, my bad analogy is meant to communicate that sometimes some element of competition also helps uh, create that checks and balances that we want to make sure that egregious behavior is not um, going to last for a very long time. Um, so again, objectives, framework, for everybody to comply with, and then um, some le some level of checks and balances, be that through real competition or yardstick competition. Um, well, well, certainly, I, I want to thank all three of you, Julia, Tanya, and Mark. I could have easily had a one-hour conversation with each of you and, and hope to one day have that. Thank you very much. I wish we had more time. And uh, I guess at this point, I need to pass it off to, to Carrie. And uh, thank you again, all three, for your excellent comments today.